www.ixvcastdc.org. Hello, everybody. My name is Heather McBroom, and I am the owner of Precision Insurance Services here in Colorado Springs. Uh, I am also an SBDC consultant for commercial insurance and have done that for the past couple years. Um, I have over 20 years experience in the insurance industry. Uh, I am a certified insurance counselor, which is a designation you get uh, after taking some very intensive classes uh, so that you are better knowledgeable about the insurance industry and uh, a better able to advise my clients on coverages and risk analysis for their business. Uh, so we're very proud of that. Um, I have an agency with two other agents here in town, so we are uh, growing and uh, very excited to uh, spend a little bit of time with you today talking about something that we are very passionate about, and that is cyber liability insurance. Uh, when I was asked to speak for an hour, my first thought was, oh my goodness, what do we do for an hour? Most people would fall asleep in an hour of insurance. So hopefully we can keep this uh, exciting and give you some really good takeaways uh, and information to help you understand your risk as a small business owner uh, and how to better protect that uh, risk that you have. My first uh, conversation I have with people is, um, you know, who has a cyber risk? And I, I think there's a misconception out there um, as to who has this risk. It is any business that utilizes the internet um, for for your, for your business, for doing business with your clients, for uh, doing things in your own business, whether you're business to business, uh, whether you're business to consumer, or whether you're business to government. If you're using technology to conduct or trans transact your business, you absolutely have uh, a risk that you need to be looking at to make sure that you understand not only your cyber risk internally, how that affects your customers, and then what your current laws are uh, regarding that, that cyber uh, risk that you may have. Um, I always say that it's not the size of your business that determines how big your risk is. Um, for a lot of us, it's what we do in our businesses. It's what we're collecting um, as far as customer data, what we're doing with that data. Are we storing it? Are we transmitting it? Um, are we collecting that data? Where are we putting that data? Um, so somebody can come to me and be uh, a one-person shop and have a really high cyber uh, risk, maybe an accountant or a insurance agent. Uh, they're collecting very personal data about their clients and often storing it in their systems, emailing this information to uh, other vendors, insurance companies, and things like that. So it, again, it's not the size of your business, it's what you're doing. So collecting personal information. This is on employees. Um, on your clients, uh, on your vendors. There's data that you're collecting. You need to look at that data and, and determine, is that data something that should be protected uh, on my end? Uh, where are we storing that data? Are we storing it in a cloud? Do we have control over the data that's being stored in that cloud? Have we talked to the vendor we're using to store that data to determine how secure are they uh, with that data of our customers? Um, do we have a website or a social media presence? How are we utilizing that presence in our business? Um, are people able to go to our website and fill out forms and provide data that would be considered personal data about them and their business? And if so, are our websites secure? Is where that data being transferred to secure? So you have to look at all lines of where that, what you're collecting and kind of the process of where that data is gonna go. Um, if you have internet access uh, or any integration for sharing or transmitting that data, like I said, if you're emailing an underwriter or going into a system and uploading a driver's license for an auto quote you're doing, that's personal identifying information. How secure is that transfer or integration of that data? And do you have control over that? Have you talked to the people who do control that um, to see how, how aware are they that they need to protect that data on your behalf? Um, any e-commerce business transactions. If I'm able to go to your website and put in my credit card information to purchase something, where is that data going and who's controlling that? From the point that I'm putting it into your system, you know, your risk 
lies right there at the very beginning. I'm giving you my personal data. Where is it going? How many places is it being transferred to? Uh, in cyberspace, is it going just here in the US? Is it being the, the data being transferred over to another country and then back? You know, where you have to think about where are all those connections? Who's touching that data and who's protecting it along the way on your behalf? Because ultimately, if I'm doing business with you, I'm your client, I expect you to protect my data and it is your responsibility to do that, whether you pass that on to somebody else or not. Um, as well as accepting credit cards. I get this pushback a lot. I don't have any um, cyber exposure. I don't collect any personal identifying information. And if somebody wants to pay, they literally click on this link, it goes to a third party and they make a payment. Again, well, who is that third party? How invested are they in protecting that data? If they get hacked, are they going to protect you and your business if I, as your client, decide to come after you for that uh, data being exposed? You know, know who you're dealing with, who you're using, and are they protecting you, or are you left there having to figure out what that exposure looks like and how to protect yourself? Um, cyber liability policies are as unique as you are. Just as if there's no cookie cutter approach to saying what your risk is in your business, same thing applies to how to protect that risk. Uh, there is no one size fits all insurance policy. There's a lot of things that are taken into consideration. Uh, the first thing is your company practices. Um, the second is what are you collecting? What kind of data are you getting from your clients and how, is that considered the personal identifying information that you are ultimately uh, on the hook for when you are collecting and transferring that data? Um, what are the number of records that you have that could be exposed? You know, one of the things that I encourage my clients to do is have a system for purging those records after a certain period of time. Don't hang on to everything forever or you're going to have a very large cyber exposure if you were to get hacked and it could be very costly. Have the right procedures in place to purge those records after a period of time so that that data is no longer there uh, and part of your responsibility. What kind of security measures do you have in place? How secure are your systems? You know, a lot of people tell me, oh, well, I have antivirus. And so my question is, what kind of antivirus? Who, who manufactured that product? Where did it come from? I mean, we all know that a lot of this stuff comes from other countries. How safe and secure is your system with that um, software installed if the software came from China or came from Russia? Um, so you really need to think about what are your security measures within your system? Are you encrypting your data? Are you um, adding additional layers of protection to access that data? Um, so you really have to look at what those measures are internally. And then ultimately, how would a breach affect your operations? Would it, if somebody breaches your system and you're unable to get back to work, what does that look like for you? Um, if you can't access your data, what does that look like for you? How long would you be down? Um, how well are you at keeping backups of the data? Um, how easy is it to work remotely and get something else up and running really quickly? All of these things are going to change the coverages within your cyber liability policy that I'm going to help you decide where your risk is and where to have the proper coverage. Um, we always talk about what are some of the digital assets uh, that we have in our systems. Um, and this is both not only just for my customers, but also for my company as well. So intellectual property. Um, we hear all the time that, you know, organizations such as Coca-Cola or other big organizations often get hacked and their intellectual property, their, their secret sauce recipe uh, is taken. What would happen if that happened to you in your business? Do you have um, information on your business in the system that you don't want other people to get a hold of? Uh, what about employee records? A lot of people tell me, I don't collect personal identifying information, yet they have 50 employees. And so, yes, you do. You collect their social security numbers. You collect their uh, driver's license numbers. You collect all of that. When you hire them, uh, where are you storing that information? Is that something that can be accessed accessed by a hacker if you were to get hacked. Um, what kind of customer data 
are you collecting? Uh, for, for industries like mine, where we're in a financial industry, I collect a lot of data on my customers, EIN numbers and social security numbers and um, taxes and, and things like that. So those are really important things for me to protect for my clients. Financial statements. Uh, this could be for your clients. This could be for you internally. And then different media files. You might have things that you have developed in your business that you that are proprietary to your business, and you don't want other people to have those files to recreate things that you've already created. You know, it could be as simple as um, having slides like this that we've developed for teaching uh, in different platforms. This is not something I would want somebody else to get their hands on and be able to put their name on it and mark it as their own. So you really have to look at what is in your system that you really care um, or that really needs to be protected. Once you've done what I call the internal audit, and oftentimes, you know, this is a, a hard thing to do. So people ask me, where'd you get all this information? How do you know what's in your system? How are you so aware of what you need to do? And to be honest with you, as a small business owner, I relied very heavily on the SBDC to help me. Um, from the very beginning of opening my class and taking a uh, very introductory Cyber 101 course with Rodney um, to doing a 13-week in-depth analysis of my business um, and how it relates to cyber attacks and cybersecurity um, and developing a cyber plan, I have pretty much done it all. And that's because it's very, very important to me as a business owner that I protect that data that I'm um, gathering for my clients. And I'm, I'm not gonna say this happened overnight. It's a lot of work. It's a lot to look at. It's a lot to think about. There's a lot of things to check off your list as you're going down to identify ways to just make your system a little bit more secure than the next person. I, I don't ever say you're unhackable. Everybody can get hacked. Most hackers will stop if they've hit a roadblock a few times and they'll move on to the next business, the one that's not uh, conscious about their data, the one that's not putting in secure security systems. So it's important to me to make sure that I've done what I can as a business owner. After that, then I come to my insurance agent. And this is where I work really closely with my clients to identify um, with the work that they've done, where does their risk lie? And how do we properly insure them against that risk? So the first thing you need to understand about cyber liability insurance is there are two different types of coverage. And these are not always on every single policy. So you need to be aware of what the difference is between the two um, and be able to ask questions to your insurance agent if there's something that you're missing um, or that you don't see that is of concern for you and your business. So the two types is first party coverage and third party coverage. And we're gonna start with first party coverage to kind of identify uh, what those coverages entail. I like to refer to first party as internal coverage. This is going to cover me, the business owner, when chaos happens, when I have realized that I've been hacked. Um, and these are some of the situations that could result in a first party uh, cyber loss. The first one is a virus in your computer system. Um, there is many times that as a business owner, I have seen people say, oh, I have the blue screen of death on my computer. And they go out and they buy a new computer, but they don't patch the system. So things like having a virus in your computer system are very serious. That is an indication that your system has been hacked and you need to stop their entry into your system, not just ignore it and move on. Um, any sort of security breach, a ransomware infection. Uh, we are seeing more and more um, with COVID and going home to work and being on unsecure systems, um, people getting hacked and actually having to pay ransom in order to get their data back from these hackers. Um, so that's something that could be covered in a first party uh, cyber loss. Uh, extortions. Uh, demands for money, demands for things to get your data back. Uh, websites infected with malware. Uh, oftentimes we'll go to a website and it says it's not secure or um, the, the system says, you know, if my system's secure enough that says, hey, this is not a secure website and there's some, some information on here that we don't think is safe, so we're actually not gonna let you go to that website. Um, so really important to make sure that your website is not transferring malware to your customers that are going to the website. 
Um, theft of your intellectual property could cause a cyber loss. Uh, theft of money or other securities. You know, you think that you think you, your staff knows better than to, you know, answer an email for what appears to be you asking for money. But in all reality, most employees just want to do the best job that they can. So they see that coming and they go, oh my gosh, Heather's busy, she's in a meeting and she needs me to go ahead and transfer, you know, $500 in, in gift cards or go get $500 in gift cards and then mail them off to here. You know, they may not think that they're doing anything malicious or, or, or dangerous to you, they're trying to be helpful and that's just human nature. So you need to know that that's probably a big risk for your company um, is somebody trying to let them know uh, to try to steal that money. And that's something that can be covered on a first party uh, cyber loss. And then denial of service. Um, just last week there was a, a um, company that did um, internet or telephone systems and they suffered a huge denial of service. For many of us, that meant we had no phones for a couple days. We didn't have internet for a couple days. Um, to get their service back, they were asked for $45 million. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I certainly don't have $45 million. So again, with my cyber liability policy, this is a loss that could be covered under that first party coverage. So really important to know what these coverages are and where your risk is so that you feel confident in asking for the coverages in those areas that you're worried about the most. The other side of it is what we call third party cyber loss. And for me, this is what I um, explain is more external. Um, this has to do more with I'm getting sued as a business. Now, I will tell you that we all live in a litigious society and anybody can sue for any reason. I think that more people haven't realized that uh, there are cyber laws that actually protect them and their data. And if their data is exposed or they believe it's been exposed, they absolutely have the right to sue the companies that they work with that were in charge of that data that they had given to them. As time progresses, I think we'll see a lot more lawsuits um, around this. And so it's really important to understand that if your, your policy doesn't have any third party coverage and you were to get sued, you don't have any defense coverage. And they're probably not going to cover a lot of those um, things that you're gonna need in the event that you have been sued. So again, I think we'll see a lot more of this as time progresses, just knowing um, kind of how people are uh, when it comes to suing for things anyway. As these lawsuits increase, these third party cyber losses are gonna increase as well. So um, some of the things that people could actually um, sue you for and would be covered under this third party cyber loss is unintended disclosure of their information. You know, accidentally sending an email to another party happens, right? We go to type in a name and it pulls up the very, you know, if I'm going to email Heather, it pulls up another Heather that I have in my email system and off goes this important data that I didn't intend for them to have. Now, most people aren't going to be malicious about that and they're going to say, oops, you sent this to the wrong place, I'm going to delete it. But what happens if that doesn't happen? Um, our laptops, our phones, everything is digital for us business owners. So if my phone gets stolen, if my laptop gets lost, um, I'm losing my customers' data and information and that could result uh, in a lawsuit or a harm to them that would be covered under this third party coverage. Um, infringement of copyright or in intellectual property rights. You normally see this in stuff like advertising on your website, uh, things like that. That's something that you could be sued for and could be covered under here. Uh, publications that slander or disparage another person or organization. Uh, that's also something that could be covered under this uh, policy. Transmittal of a virus uh, or any malware or ransomware. You know, I, I tell people all the time, you get an email from somebody or you get a Facebook invite from somebody and you're thinking, well, this is really weird. I haven't asked for anything from them or I'm already their friend on Facebook. And next thing you know, within an hour, they're telling everybody, hey, don't click on that friend invite because I've been hacked. And you have to think, well, if they've been hacked and they're utilizing those same uh, phone, uh, laptop, whatever, to also 
get to their clients' data, their work emails, their um, systems where they're saving that information. And all they do is say, oh, don't click on that. We don't know that the, that the virus that they have, that the ransomware or the malware that they have is not still being transferred over to us if we did happen to click on that. So it's really important to make sure that going forward, if these things happen to you, first off, you're, you're looking into it. It's not just, hey, forget about it, don't click on it. What about the people who did click on it? What about the stuff that's in your system that's being exposed now? And how are you protecting those people later? As well as the people who are experiencing that. Go to those people and talk to them. What exactly happened? Where is my data in your system? Is it tied to the same systems that you're using now? And, and don't just take it as, oh, well, oops, they, they have some sort of hack. If you transmit that virus into my system and you cause my company to go down and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, I may, may very well have to file a lawsuit against you. So this is where we're gonna start seeing more and more things come to light as companies really have to uh, come back at you and transfer that risk or come after you and say, hey, this isn't fair. Yeah, you should be responsible for this data. Um, any access by an unauthorized user in your system? Uh, denial of service attacks can cause a breach of contract. So if I have a contract with an internet provider and they get a DOS and I'm unable to run my business for several days, um, that's a breach of contract that I have with them. And so I may have to sue them in order to get my uh, business income covered that I was down for seven days. I still had to pay employees. I didn't, wasn't unable to write new policies or help my clients. Uh, that's something I might have to go back to them for. Uh, and, and the same with your clients for you. Um, and then non-compliance with any state, federal, or or state or federal data breach laws. Um, I don't know about you guys, but every state has its own cyber and data breach law. To be an expert in that is crazy. They're changing all the time. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to get a, an updated book every year uh, from the SBDC that shows me some of those things, but I'm not an expert. I don't want to be the expert. I don't want to know. Uh, ultimately, you are on hook for the data you collect on your client wherever that client resides. So if I have clients in other states, which I do as an insurance agent, I'm on the hook for those laws. If I have clients overseas that are purchasing products on my website, I'm on the hook for those laws. Uh, and that's not something that I want to be the expert on. So having um, a policy that will respond and make me compliant with those and give me that expertise uh, is worth it to me uh, not having to do that myself and worry that I could be sued for not doing something that the law told me I had to do. Now there are several ways to get cyber liability insurance coverage. Um, there are many carriers out there that offer this product. What I will tell you is none of them are the same. In fact, I get asked often to compare policies from one carrier to another to determine who has the better coverage. And out of all the policies that I compare on a regular basis, cyber liability policies are the hardest to compare because the coverages are not the same. The terminology is not the same. The definitions are not the same. And the coverages are not the same. So it's really hard to look at one and the other and determine which one is better. Again, we have to go back to what is your risk uh, to determine which one's better for you. But you can get what we call a monoline manuscripted policy from a carrier. This is where the carrier says, all right, this is our policy. This is our forms. This is how we want to cover this part of the industry. Um, they are usually by themselves. That's what monoline means. So it's a policy all on its own. They're usually more robust um, because these carriers have actually thought about the exposure and thought about the proper ways to cover those exposures. Um, another way that you can be covered is throw in endorsements on an existing policy. So a few years ago, we saw carriers saying, okay, well, we know that there's data breaches going on and that there's laws and this is evolving. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw in a little bit of coverage for you on your general liability policy. And hey, we're not going to charge you that much, maybe a hundred bucks for the year. Uh, and we're going to put it on every policy. So everybody gets cyber coverage. Um, so 
may be okay for your business, more often than not, it's not enough coverage. So don't just assume because you have a policy that says you have some data breach coverage or some cyber coverage on it that you're covering your risk appropriately. You have to talk to your agent. You have to be able to explain your risk to your agent for them to explain to you how to be properly covered. So cyber liability insurance came out about maybe, maybe five to 10 years ago. Hasn't been out very long. And when they first came out, uh, as with any coverage, the insurance uh, industry changes constantly. So they came out and they said, hey, we can offer cyber liability insurance for a very low cost. We can write a whole bunch of policies and we can make a whole bunch of money. Um, and that's kind of how it started. So anybody could get a policy. It was very low cost, very low barrier to entry. Um, and agents that were knowledgeable would talk about it with their clients. Unfortunately, a lot of agents didn't know what type of coverage it was and they were afraid to talk about it because they didn't want to answer questions that they didn't know the answers to. So a lot of people did not get any coverage there in the beginning. Now, fast forward five years, we have seen incredible increases in hacks. We have seen incredible increases in ransom uh, requests. And now carriers are experiencing many, many more claims. So as with anything, as the claims go up, the pricing is going to go up, as well as some of the things that the insurance companies are going to look for. So no longer can I write an insurance uh, cyber liability policy if you don't have some controls in place. Uh, so again, this is where it becomes really important uh, that if you don't know anything about how to protect that data, that you connect with the SBDC, get some free consulting, take a course um, to, so that you can get some of these controls in place before you even try to cover yourself with the liability insurance. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to be able to move forward with even getting you a quote. Uh, one of the things that they do require now is double factor authentication. It's not a wish, it's a demand. And that's because you are less likely to have somebody get into your systems if it has to text you every time somebody tries. Uh, so it makes perfect sense why they would want that. They need to mitigate, they want you to mitigate the risk so that they can try to keep these premiums low. They want backup procedures. They don't want to, uh, again, they want to mitigate the risk. They don't want to pay out to recreate um, years and years and years worth of data because you never back up your data. Uh, that can be very costly to an insurance company. So now they're requiring that you have backup procedures. Um, they know that your number one risk are your employees, and so they are actually requiring employee training procedures now with some carriers, uh, saying that you must educate your employees on what does a phishing email look like, that you would never request them to go do anything or send money or anything via email, that you would come to them in person um, and educate them to make sure that that risk stays on the lower end for those insurance carriers. Um, some of them want a cyber risk management plan. They want to know uh, incident response plans. They want to know that you are knowledgeable enough to say, if something happens, this is immediately what we do. Uh, it's very important. It's going to limit the, the claim in uh, a lot of different areas, including the PR part of your policy. So they're looking at this and saying, how well do you know what you're going to do if something happens? How quickly are you going to call us? How quickly would you notice if something happens? Um, firewalls is an absolute mandatory now uh, to, to have a cyber liability policy. They're not going to insure against just wide open systems. So again, knowing your, if you have a firewall and where you're getting that, that firewall from uh, is going to be really important. They're looking at vendor management controls. They want to know who are your vendors? Are you talking to them about these type of things? Um, I've had clients tell me that they don't feel comfortable calling Square and asking them, you know, hey, if you're hacked, what happens to my customer's data and are you protecting me? Well, if you're not comfortable, then you shouldn't be doing business with that vendor. So they're looking at that now and saying, hey, who do you do business with and what kind of controls are in place? 
Um, and then encryption of data in emails is an absolute must uh, anymore. And that's because you can stop that personal information from even being seen by the hacker if you're encrypting that data correctly. And so these are just some small things that you can do um, to help make that data more secure. Again, it doesn't make you unhackable, but it's going to help you make your systems more secure. Uh, it's going to help you protect your customers' data, and it's going to make you eligible to be able to go to an insurance company and say, hey, I know the risk is there, and I don't want to deal with this, so please cover me in the event something happens. Now, there are certain carriers who are a little bit more lenient on some of their guidelines. However, when an insurance agent goes to a carrier and says, look, this is the insured, this is their exposure, and this is the kind of coverage they want, they're going to look at some of those factors. And they can ultimately limit your coverage based on their evaluation of your business and how well you protect that data in your business. Uh, some of the ways they're going to limit the coverage is they can limit the scope of coverage by modifying the policy language. They can specifically exclude or include uh, specific coverages. So if they see that, hey, uh, this, insu this in company is a high risk in this area, they may exclude coverage for that particular thing until you are less of a risk or you've actually put in some uh, controls in those areas. They can put a sublimit on coverage, and a sublimit just means I may have a million dollar policy, but for that particular thing uh, that is high risk to the insurance company because I haven't put any controls in place, they might give me only $100,000 of coverage if I were to be exposed in that area. Uh, they can apply a higher retention or deductible to the policy. So they might say, hey, this guy's really risky. Um, we're going to impose a $10,000 deductible so that all the little stuff doesn't end up being our problem. It ends up being his until he does some changes in the system. Um, and they can charge additional premium. So oftentimes, I don't see the price until the underwriter has reviewed the, po uh, reviewed the risk. So if I come to them with a risk that I've worked with, we have controls in place, we understand our, our exposure, we've done everything we can on our end, the, the premium that the company's going to offer is going to be a lot less. If I come to them with a risk that just doesn't have any controls in place, doesn't really know, this is their first time kind of even exploring this option, you know, their rate may be double, triple what the other guy's rate is. So really important to keep that cost low uh, and know that that's something that they look at. Um, cyber liability policies are written a little bit different than most policies, and that's because they are claims made policies. And the only thing that you need to understand is a claims made policy means the policy that you have in force at the time the claim is made is the policy that's going to respond to that. It doesn't matter when the incident occurred, when the work occurred, it's going to be the policy at the time the claim is made. So these policies have what is called a retroactive date. Usually a retroactive date is the very first date you took out coverage. Hopefully that date was before you actually started working in your business uh, and working with clients. What the insurance carrier says is, we agree that we are going to pay for any claims made during this policy period as long as the work was done between the retroactive date and the date of the claim. So it's really important to understand that you need to keep that retroactive date if you change carriers. You need to be aware that that limitation exists. And if you were to ever cancel a policy, you may still need coverage to apply because essentially, if I cancel a claims made policy today and somebody files a claim on me two weeks from now, I have no coverage. It doesn't matter that I've had a policy for 10 years and been paying premium because I have no policy to respond to that claim. So oftentimes when we, you know, businesses go out of business or whatever the case may be, if we have to close down that policy, we still need a tail policy to still cover the exposure for the claims that could come in later. So really important to understand how these policies are different than a general liability policy or many of your other policies. One of the unique things about a cyber insurance policy is there is something called insuring agreements. And what this means is it's not 
if you see a declarations page and it has six to eight different titles down that page, and those are what we call the insuring agreements. If you see a thousand dollars or a million dollars in one section, but you don't see any dollar amount in those other insuring agreements, that actually means you're not covered. There's no coverage in those other insuring agreements. So it's really important to know what the insurance uh, insuring agreements are, what exposure that covers, and whether you need that coverage or not. We don't want you paying for anything you don't need, but we certainly don't want you left exposed in areas for coverage that you did need and have you think, well, I have a cyber liability policy and I have an agent, so I must be covered properly. You need to know how to look at these policies and determine, are you getting the coverage that you need? Are you paying for what you're expecting to pay for? And is this policy gonna respond as you expect it to at the time of a claim? So we're gonna briefly go through a couple of these insuring agreements to kind of give you an idea of what they are and what's kind of included in them. Uh, one of the first ones you'll see, and again, terminology changes based on carrier, policy, stuff like that. So the first one is a security breach expense. Uh, this insuring agreement is gonna cover things like um, the cost that, uh, to establish if a breach has occurred. So I have to call my insurance company. I think that something's happened. I'm not really sure. They're going to hire an investigative team to go in and go through all your data and figure out if you have been hacked and if so, what was exposed. Um, that can be very costly and very time consuming. Uh, the cost to determine any actions necessary to remediate the actions uh, that led to a security breach. This could be shutting down an email system. Uh, this could be finding out you know, exactly where that point of entry is and closing it and making sure that they can't get into your system again. Again, can be very costly. Uh, cost to notify all parties affected by the breach. In Colorado, our data um, security law says that if I have been, uh, if I have suffered a breach and my client's personal identifying information has been um, given up, then I have to, by law, notify them that this has happened. And I have to offer them a year of credit monitoring services. Well, if we have a system with 700 and something records in there, that can be very costly to notify each of them to pay for that. Um, and that's something the security breach expense will pay for. Overtime salaries to pay employees to handle inquiries. Um, hiring an outsourced IT company to come in and help. You know, I had a, a small business that was, uh, suffered a, a breach to their system the other day. And, you know, she said, hey, I can't comply with everything they're asking. One, I don't have the knowledge to do what they're asking me to do. And two, I don't have the time. So they uh, offered her to hire and outsource a local IT company to come in and do that for her. You know, very beneficial so that she could get back to business and doing what she does. Um, call center costs. Sometimes if you have a lot of uh, customers and the, you know, you send out those notifications, you get a lot of phone calls uh, afterwards. What does this letter mean? How do I protect myself? Yes, I want to get the credit monitoring. Well, do you want them calling the office? Do you want your office flooded with calls all day and having to stop what you're doing to deal with that? Or, you know, could you have a call center that's, that your insurance company provides, handles your customers for you? Um, and then, of course, providing, providing the credit monitoring to those affected by the breach. You know, a three-company um, credit monitoring for a year you know, could, could cost about $1,000 per person. That's a pretty big expense, especially if we're talking about hundreds of people that we need to provide that to. So that's another cost that, being, that can be covered under this security breach expense. Uh, another insuring agreement is extortion threats. So um, if your system is hacked and you get a, some sort of threat, uh, a threat for ransomware or whatever, the uh, first thing you need to do is validate the extortion threat. Uh, that can be very costly. So your insurance company can come in and uh, hire the professional to validate that that threat is actually legit. Um, maybe you have to pay the ransomware. Maybe you have to get a loan. Well, this can cover the interest cost for any loan taken out to pay that. Uh, it will pay reward payments to an informant that leads to the arrest of the person uh, who's responsible for the threat. Uh, and any other reasonable expenses uh, incurred for independent negotiators or an IT firm to help with protection from future threats. 
as well as the ransom payments themselves. So going back to the um, example of the company who, the telephone company who needs their system, they have clients, hundreds of millions of clients that they have to provide a service to, and they now have to pay $45 million to get their system back up and running. Well, if they had a great cyber liability insurance policy in place, you know, those ransom payments could have been covered under there. Uh, so really important to understand um, and look at, does your company have a possible exposure for this and how much money do you need to cover that? Uh, another insuring agreement is the replacement or restoration of your electronic data. Uh, this is going to pay for the loss to restore data if, you, if your data has been compromised from a cyber attack or has been uh, taken or held ransom. You know, some people can mitigate this risk themselves. They can say, hey, our, our system does automatic backups every night. If something happens to the data, I'll just restore my backup. And that may be okay. Uh, but you need to know that if you see this on your policy and there's no dollar figure there, you don't have coverage for that. And that may be something that you don't want to self-insure on. So knowing that that's what that insuring agreement covers is really important. Business income and extra expense is also covered uh, as an insuring agreement. And for some people, again, this risk may be very low, this may be very high. Um, how fast, if you have suffered a cyber attack, can you get back up and running so that you're continuing to bring in money and run your business and pay your employees? Would you guys be dead in the water? Would nobody be able to work? Can you not get back up and running somewhere else? Uh, what kind of loss would that be? Is it peak season and you've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the, the breach for Facebook just the other day uh, resulted in millions of dollars of lost income just in the one day it was down. What would that look like for your business? And how, how concerned are you? And are you properly covered? Does the limit of insurance on that insuring agreement properly reflect what your loss could be if uh, you can't get back to work immediately? Uh, public relations expense is another insuring agreement. And this has, you know, once, I, I think a lot of people are afraid to come out and say, hey, we've suffered a breach to their customers. They're afraid of what it looks like for their business. They're afraid of their reputation um, in the community. And so public relations expense is a really important one for a lot of people. Uh, it's gonna cover the fees and the costs associated with hiring a public relation firm. Um, and then as well as uh, reasonable cost to restore or, pr or protect your reputation in response to a data breach. Um, I think a lot of people feel like it's their fault. You know, you guys, if, if you suffer a breach, it, it's not, if you're, if you're being educated and taking all the steps that you can to protect your customer's data, it shouldn't look bad on you. Uh, you should be able to come out and, and truly say, I, I'm a victim. I, I suffered, uh, you know, it's no different than theft. Somebody came in and stole this information. Uh, these people feel very violated and it, it's a very scary thing to go through, but they're also afraid to come out and talk to people about it. So the public relation expense can be really important, uh, especially in smaller communities or if you have a lot of clients in, in a specific area or you're in a niche market where, you know, those clients, uh, ultimately, if you were to lose them, your business would suffer significantly because there's not a lot of people in that niche market that you can market to. So really important to think about what that looks like for you and how much coverage you need in order to protect your business and your reputation if you got hacked. Uh, security breach liability is another insuring agreement. Uh, this will cover the legal obligation and defense expenses uh, as, re as a result of a claim. One thing I always tell people, nobody likes to pay insurance premiums. We get it. But nobody likes to be on the other end when you're exposed and have no coverage either. And insurance policies, to me, are just as important for their defense as they are for the coverage that they provide. And so every policy is going to have defense coverage built into the policy. Now, there's two ways that they do it. It's either covered in, inside the limits or outside the limits. So here's an example. If I have a million dollar cyber liability policy and I have a million dollars under security breach liability, this is something I'm really concerned about, and I get sued, and not by one person, let's say it turns out to be a class action lawsuit uh, and all 150 of my clients decide to join ship and, and everybody's gonna come at me at once. 
Well, one, if I don't have this coverage, I don't have any defense for this either. Um, two, if the defense is included inside the limits, you can imagine how quickly $350 an hour of an attorney and his staff's time will dwindle that million dollars down to almost nothing. And the way it works is the insurance company is only required to cover you until they've hit that limit. So if they hit the limit and I'm still in the middle of a lawsuit, you could imagine they're going to be nice, but they're going to say, hey, we're done here. You need to have another attorney here to represent you and good luck. So it's really important to know, are those limits inside or outside? Uh, the, are the defense limits inside or outside the other limits? Most of the time in cyber insurance, they're included within the limits. So now is a million dollars enough coverage? Is a two million aggregate enough coverage? It depends and something you definitely should be considering because you may have not enough coverage to not only defend you, but then deal with the ramifications afterwards. Um, compensa uh, compensatory damages, settlement amounts, cost awarded by the judge uh, for judgments and settlements. Again, if I've used up all my limits already in defense, when it gets to this point, I have nothing. And I'm exposed as a business owner to pay those. Uh, punitive damages and then the defense expenses. Uh, some other insuring agreements, you can see con uh, content liability, uh, where um, actual error or misstatement or misleading statements are published or posted on a website or some of your materials. Um, programming errors and emissions liability, you know, people who um, are responsible for doing programming in your systems or uh, programming different things, if there's an error in there, those can also be covered. Um, again, you have to start with where Look at your business and say, where is everything coming from? What does our processes and procedures look like? Have it laid out and look at each step along the way and circle those areas that you're concerned that one, you've gathered information, two, you stored that information, or three, you've transferred that information and where did it go? By identifying those areas, you can identify where you need to put proper controls in place. And then you can come to your insurance agent and better articulate what your needs are so that they can insure you correctly. As, well, as much as we try to make sure you are always insured correctly, a lot of this stuff, if I'm not in your day-to-day -day operations, I may miss something. Um, as an insurance agent, I like to come to my clients operations uh, every year and review their policy with them at their location. Why? Because I get to see things that they don't think about to talk to me about. Or I see new services. I see a piece of equipment they bought over the year uh, that we didn't have covered. That's a little bit harder to do when it comes to cyber liability insurance. I still want to protect you in the way that you need to be protected, but I can't see a lot of the processes and transactions going on in the background. So I rely on you to understand where you feel that you might be at risk and have those conversations with me to make sure that you're going to be covered correctly. You know, I keep saying the word hack, and a lot of people say, well, what is a hack? What does that mean, Heather? Um, so when I say the term hack, I'm talking about things like ransomware. Somebody gets into your system and says, hey, you are no longer authorized to get into that system until you pay me $1 million. And guess what? You can't get in there until you pay them. <laughs> um, denial of service. Uh, they will shut down your system, and you can no longer serve your clients and clientele uh, until you sometimes give them money, comply with whatever they're asking for, could be Bitcoin, whatever, um, but they could stop your ability to serve your clients. Uh, malware and in putting um, infectious stuff on your computer that not only could ruin your system, but can ruin your client's systems. And I don't think we put enough thought into this. I care about my clients, and all of my clients are business owners. So if I'm not taking the proper steps to protect their data, if I'm not notifying them the second that I find out that something's happened, then they're not protecting their systems. They're not doing things on their end. I'm not only exposing them, I'm exposing all their clients as well because I've introduced that malware into their system. So this is not stuff to take lightly. Um, I think at last check, the insurance companies have claimed that a typical cyber attack costs them $8 million. 
Most small businesses would not be able to afford something like that. Uh, this would put them out of business. I don't want to be responsible for somebody going out of business. I don't want to be responsible for my client or their clients or anybody else um, having to deal with this. So uh, that's some of the malware and, and, and really thinking through what's happened, what has been exposed, and where has that information gone. Um, and then social engineering. It, I've said it a million times, your employees are your biggest risk, and not because they mean to be. They want to be helpful. Um, so one of the things that we do in our agency is uh, phishing emails are emails that come through that look to be legit, uh, but aren't. And they oftentimes have a link or a document to open, and by clicking on that link or opening that document, you are opening that pathway for them to get into your system. So one of the things that we do is we offer a $10 Starbucks card to everybody who identifies a phishing email and brings it to the rest of the staff. It has raised awareness. Uh, it's kind of fun to dig through it and say, oh, well, why do you think that wasn't for me? Well, this and this and this and this. Um, and they're, uh, they're actually aware and looking for it always um, because they want to be that person who brought it up and said, look what I got. Um, so phishing emails is a really big uh, exposure to your business, a good way that you could get hacked, and also something that you have control over as far as trying to educate your employees on. Uh, the funds transfer fraud, again, getting the email saying, hey, I need you to transfer money to this place. I'm really busy right now. Can you get in my system and do that? Um, I educate my employees. You will never get an email from me requesting money or gift cards or anything else. If I need something of monetary value, I will pick up the phone and call you. So please, if you see an email like that, bring it to my attention. Um, and then fraud against customers and vendors. Hopefully you're all hanging in there. I know insurance is not super exciting, but uh, hopefully uh, you're getting some really good information and some takeaways from this so that you guys can go back uh, and figure out what you need to do on your ends. Um, first party coverage, uh, again, we're gonna go back to the fact that there's those two types of coverage and it's really important to make sure that your policy has both. And oftentimes it's not very clear uh, unless you like to read policy, which we know most People who purchase insurance don't care to read the policy because that's not what they do, uh, and it's not always in English. Um, it's important to know that you're talking to this to your agent. Hey, you gave me a cyber quote. Does it include first party coverage? Does it include third party coverage? What insuring agreements does that include? If they can't answer that, is that an appropriate agent to be giving you an assessment on your cyber liability insurance? Or should you talk to somebody who is more um, educated and versed in that particular line of coverage? Um, because ultimately this is very important for you, your business, and your customers. Um, so we talked about some of the things that the first party coverage does, the customer notification requirements, uh, the purchasing credit monitoring, the investigation of the source, the business interruption. And what I wanna do is give you an example of a claim that we had recently. So I had a customer um, who collects a lot of personal identifying information on their clients. And they were very proactive in wanting to protect that data wanting to be aware, wanting their staff to be aware. They spent countless hours training staff. They spent countless hours in um, programs that they had created to uh, educate all of the company. Um, they spent money on securing their systems, making sure that their firewalls were in place, uh, making sure that if people were utilizing uh, company data, it was on company provided um, laptops, phones, things that they could control, um, that they had procedures and processes in place where the, everybody knew if you were on an unsecure system, you utilized the VPN that the company provided um, so that your data would stay secure regardless of where you were accessing that data. Um, they did stuff like made sure modems were hidden from site uh, so that nobody could get into those systems. They paid for third party monitoring of those systems. They did uh, a cyber plan. Uh, everything that they could do to say, I feel confident that I've done everything in my power to go ahead and protect the data that I collect and protect my customers. And the first thing we did when we talked to them is we applauded them for even doing that. So many businesses, because 
we wear a lot of hats as business owners. We have a lot of stuff going on. And so we make these to-do lists and sometimes this doesn't make the list or sometimes it's really far down on the list. Um, and this is so important to be looking at from the very beginning of getting your business started. Um, and, and so we applauded them for doing everything that they had done. This was amazing. We were able to get them a very good cyber liability policy in place. It covered absolutely everything that they were concerned about. We knew all of their operations inside and out because they had a plan. And everything was laid out in that plan. So we knew what we were dealing with and how to properly cover it. And we gave them adequate coverage. Well, we get a call a few months later that they had an email that had made it through their system that said from Microsoft that there was um, suspicious activity in their email. And they were concerned. They didn't know what that meant. It was the first time they had seen it. Um, and, and they called Microsoft and they got somebody and they didn't know either. Um, and they weren't really helpful. So they called us and said, what do we do? And so the first thing we talked about was if we don't know and you're concerned that there's somebody in your system, we call it in immediately. And I have to say, this was my first time on the claim side of it, where I got to experience how an insurance company responds and how they worked with my client and what the outcome was. And I was very impressed with the insurance company's response as well. So we wrote them a monoline manuscripted policy. It covered exactly what they needed it to cover or where their concerns were. And this company, even though they're a London insurance company, they were on it immediately. There was teams of people. They had a response team. They had a legal team. They had their adjuster. They had uh, a PR team. They had, I think those were it initially, all on a call immediately with them, with their company, with all of the people in their organization. Um, not only was it scary for them, it was scary for their employees, uh, their clients didn't know yet, but every, you know, there was total internal chaos. And they got on the phone with them right away, they got on a Zoom call, they explained to everybody how they were gonna jump right in, they calmed everybody down. Uh, it, I think the business was only down for about a day of total chaos where they felt that they could get back to work and actually start to resume their operations. And for the owner, she didn't have a lot of knowledge on how to fix this stuff or what she needed to do. She knew she had clients all over the US. She didn't know what laws she was on the hook for. She didn't have the knowledge to go into the system and find where uh, the breach had happened or close it or do anything else. And so she was able to rely on her insurance company to come in and handle it for her. And she was able to get back to work. And she was able to continue to make money in her business while the company did the work for her. They hired an outside IT firm to come in and do uh, all of the things that they needed to be installed on the computers so that they could monitor it and see where the activity was coming from. Uh, they were able to go back and look at all of the data. Ultimately, what had happened was, internally, she had an employee who received a phishing email. And all they did was click on a link. And that was all it took. Now, she had already educated her staff should they have known better? Sure. But did they mean to do anything malicious? No. And so it's something she had to deal with. And in that click of an email, or click of a link, the hacker got into the email system. They went into the Microsoft account, into the admin center. They created a rule that said every email coming out of here will be forwarded to their email address or whatever email address they spoofed it to be. And then they created a rule that any email from Microsoft identifying a security breach or suspicious activity to be deleted immediately. How this one got through, we have no idea, but luckily it did. Now, second it got through, she was smart enough to call and initiate something. What we had found is that it had actually happened two and a half months prior. And she was never notified because they had set that rule to delete that email that should have notified her. So nobody was seeing suspicious activity going on. This is how sneaky they can be in the background doing what they do and taking that data. She was able to have her insurance company 
find everything, find where the source had come from, even down to the employee that had clicked on it so she could better educate that employee. They were able to shut it down. They were able to go back and look at the data and determine how many records were exposed and how many actually included personal identifying information and what states those uh, clients were from and what the laws were for those states. And all of this went on for about two months of teams of people working on her behalf while she continued to work and do what she needed to do to keep her business going. So peace of mind, um, I, I always say that your cyber liability insurance policy is your first line of, of defense outside of those basic things that you can do. Because at the end of the day, we aren't cyber experts, right? We're business owners and we don't know all the ins and outs of of the cyber stuff and how to respond and everything else. So I rely on my policy. But if my policy is poorly written, if I haven't been able to articulate what I need to my insurance agent and it doesn't do what I need it to do, at the end of the day, it's worthless. So it's really important to make sure that you understand the coverage enough to have those conversations, that you know what it can cover and where you feel that you want that coverage. Not only did she have a response team, not only did they hire outside IT, the legal team jumped in and did all the notifications required for each state so she was compliant with the law and now the PR team is jumping in and they're writing the letters to the clients and they're paying for the credit monitoring and they're helping maintain her reputation in the community. And this is really important.